Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins. This apparently means power and control. It was what Tony Blair used to... Doesn't matter about that. Anyway, um, today <laughs> is an in-person, long-form podcast chat with one of my favourite artists, Rick Astley, who won all of last summer with his performance at Glastonbury singing those uh, um, Smith songs and doing ACDC drum stuff. It was really awesome to talk to him. We, we covered so much ground and there was a load of tangential meanderings that well, they excite me and you're going to love it. He was an amazing guest and it was really, really cool. I sort of feel so inspired that I want to touch the keyboard, but there's people talking near it. So let's do that. Enjoy. Again. Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Rides Again. Today on the Long Form Podcast, my guest is the inimitable Rick Astley. I love what you did with that R there. Thank you. I always try and roll it. <laughs> I know you do, It dear. makes me sound really sophisticated, I think. I'm a self-made man, you know. Yeah, it's also, it's a bit continental as well, I, I think. Tr- yeah, the it's more inclusive of an for the mainlanders. Yeah, maybe. Definitely. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm very good, actually. Um, we had a, I wasn't super well over Christmas. I've been like a lot of people, kind of, you know, you work right up to Christmas and then yeah. just go boom. Yeah. Um, but we had a nice time anyway. It wasn't and COVID, was it? No, I kept checking for it. I kept yeah. testing and it kept saying no. Yeah. And so I believed That's it. That's a good sign. But I was just, I just, just had no energy and was just completely flat. Yeah. And I'm getting myself back together and I kind of feel normal again, you know. But just before Christmas, you did that thing, didn't you? The yeah, we did. Um, yeah, we, we, do you mean the New Year's Eve show you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Which was on, we actually recorded it on the 12th at the Roundhouse. Yeah. Um, which, as you know, obviously. Um, Cracking venue. It's just great, I think. Yeah. And I've been to a couple of, been to gigs, but I've also been to a couple of events there and thought this is a venue that you can almost do anything in yeah. it, it, the venue itself has got so much charm about it yes. that wherever you put a camera it's kind of interesting it's not a, just a breeze block wall you I know think sound wise it's probably quite challenging because it's yeah maybe round hence the name <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um yeah but i think we i think we overall i think we were really really happy that we did it there yeah. because it sort of it felt like a proper gig um obviously we were shooting it to be a tv moment but mm-hmm it felt right that we had a real audience who wanted to be there. You know, we didn't usher them so in. So how the much of an course. audience can you have in a place like that when you've got to set it up like a TV thing? Well, because, I mean, I, I, I did the Sam Ryder one. There's, yeah. a hu- there's huge gaps in the audience right, where okay. they've got rigging and yeah, because you know, it, yeah. tracks and stuff. To be honest, I think, as I remember it, I don't seem to... I think they had a crane in, obviously, and a yeah. couple of, you know, obviously the technical crew were, you know, everywhere kind of thing. Um, but they did an amazing job of being discreet about yeah. and keeping it like a gig. So yeah. for us on stage, it felt like so it a felt gig, like a to gig. be honest. Yeah, it did, That's it did, which was fantastic, yeah. That probably comes across, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, So how much um, live stuff did you do last year? Um, we did a bunch of gigs through the summer, um, different festivals, um, and Highlight it's weird. probably being... Well, Glastonbury obviously Glastonbury comes, comes to amazing. mind, yeah. Um, we also did Electric Picnic in Ireland, which was fantastic. So is festivals a more, a more sort of recent thing for you. yeah definitely i'd say the last maybe four or five years just you know a few years before covid i guess um and we did one in um in japan and um summer sonic oh okay and um because you have to choose between that and fuji rocks don't oh you? is that right okay well I, well it used I, yeah. to be like that there, okay. there used to be kind of such fierce rivalry between the two right. promoters. So you could do one almost, but not the other. And yeah, yeah and you wouldn't you do have one, back. you're never going to do the oh, other. Oh, really? Like, I never do it's it. like oh, that, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's <laughs> okay. how it used to be. Good to know. know. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so we, we, we went to Japan to do that. Um, and that was probably one of the first big ones where I kind of went, what am I doing here? Because I looked at the lineup. <laughs> do you mean like imposter syndrome? Yeah, a little bit, but not in like it. I, I, and I do have imposter syndrome a little bit here and there, but not as kind of like, I mean, just a logical, what am I doing? Right. Because I looked at a lot Why of Why did bands, they book me kind of thing? Kind of. Mm. Um, and it was pretty eclectic, to be fair. And yeah. there were quite a few pop things. There was even a bit of K-pop there, you know, oh, yeah. which, which I found interesting because I know that's exploded over the last whatever it's decade or less or whatever, but to actually see it happening, mm. like, at the, and I didn't know who it was. I can't remember what they were called to be honest right now. But you know, maybe it was BTS. I don't think it was. It could. That's have been. the only one I know actually. Yeah, well, okay. It could have <laughs> been. It could have been, but I'm not sure. Um, mm. But it was a, a whole, you know, boy band thing with the dance routines and the whole yeah. bit and everything. And the crowd girls, especially, were going mad and all the rest of it. Um, I was wondering, actually, did the crowd do the dance routines as well? 
well like they'd have to go some because they're pretty sophisticated those oh, routines oh yeah. yeah oh they're not messing around yeah <laughs> um it's but, a huge part of the k-pop experience I yeah suppose, well, it? well it is i think that is part of it and i think obviously if we look at tiktok and all these things that have been kicking off Mm. people relate to music in, in not just in an audio way anymore do they I mean I know yeah. there's always been videos but it's really part of being connected to the artist as well they do these routines we'll do our version of it and stick that on TikTok yeah. you know what I mean it's like a, okay. a, a, a you know do you do a lot of TikTok I do some TikTok again <laughs> I find it like I find it um I, I like social media for the sense that if you, as an artist or a, a whatever, a human, want to say something, you can. Mm. And I didn't have that growing up. There was no way of, of doing that, of reaching anybody. You know what yeah. I mean? You went and played in the local pub, you know, yeah. if you were lucky. And that's, um, that's how I remember it too. It's kind of like the way you find your audience was, you know, like a builder yeah. finds his clients. You know, yeah. it's, it was yeah. word of word mouth. Word of mouth, and, totally, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because there was no other... Until, it, until I guess, you, as a band or a performer or whatever, you'd get to a level where someone would come and review it, there was mm -hmm. no way of getting anybody to know. Yeah. So, and one of the things I love about the social media thing is that there's some genuinely talented people who perhaps also wouldn't necessarily go the pub bar route, because mm. maybe that's not where their confidence is, or that's mm. not where they, how they express themselves, or what have you. Mm. And so they would have been dead in the water. But do you yeah. not feel that... The thing about the social media attention span that's mm. required yeah. means that not not really required to write full compositions. I know they just need mean. to sort of it's a different thing, an attention grabbing it, thirty second yeah. clip or something. Yeah, and it is a very different thing. And I think I've read a few things about um, this thing about uh, even big artists only writing songs to order for a certain right. time limit. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but it needs a middle age. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, right. Well, it's it reminds me of. Um, <laughs> When we, oh, I don't know if you've done if you've done a lot of um, writing for other artists and stuff. Not like that, really, I've dabbled in it, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, one of the things that like my publisher used to say to me is like, "Have you got song starts?" And when they said song start, they meant verse, chorus, and bridge or right. middle eight. Yeah. Um, you just need one of each. So okay. like, it could be because like forty-five seconds of music okay. with three different sections, and then and then that was what they would use to sort of yeah. farm out, and then see if there's any if if then on bites, then you go and develop it and finish it. Finish and they the want to join off. in, obviously, in co yeah. which is a totally yeah. different way to like if you're in a band or you're yeah. or, you know if you're Leonard Cohen or someone like that, yeah. you know, you'd sit there and you'd yeah. meticulously create a narrative that goes across the whole yeah. song. You know, yeah. that that art form is. But it's but it. It, being killed by social media sort of yeah know. but I, but i think i think what it is i just because i'm I'm entertained by it occasionally yeah. i like see somebody and i go they're amazing who is this person mm. who what why are they in the bedroom what what get them out of the bedroom you know what i mean yeah, yeah. every now and again but then I do you find that. that like the, the ones that are really good guitar players they yeah. come out of the bedroom and then when they stand up the guitar's still here <laughs> <laughs> well it's an interesting well it is an interesting one because the guitar thing um is again is is I think the standard of musicianship mm. has just gone like that. Mm. It's like crazy. Do you think because even since COVID or before? I don't know. That's an interesting point. I don't know about that might have helped because people were at home, obviously. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's more to do with, I think, be, be having YouTube for 20 years or whatever it is yeah. now, 15 years properly kind of thing, where I do it all the time. I go, what are the courses that bloody thing? <laughs> you know, and I'm on there and I'll right. find some 14 year old kid in Kansas and he's going, look, everyone thinks it's this but it ain't mm. it's actually this you know what i mean mm. and i'm like oh my god he's right you know yeah, yeah and and um and i think that then spurs everyone else on and everyone's learning techniques I and what we used to do is film mtv yeah and pause it and then yeah. just sort of try and find the shape if there right. was something you couldn't pick right. out with your ear yeah i'm mm. not very good with my ears uh, to be honest which is I not great that. for being well honestly i'm not i hear things like if i go into we've done things with string you know huge big things like an orchestra style thing and what have yeah. you and i can hear something's not right but i couldn't go over to someone and say by the way fourth violin no something's going on there <laughs> i couldn't do that yeah, do you yeah. mean? but i can hear that something is not quite right yeah. and and i'm very much like that with chords and stuff mm -hmm. if for whatever reason let's say i'm doing something it's not my band mm -hmm. and somebody jumps on the piano to play the chords to something if they play a slightly different version mm -hmm. i'm screwed i almost have to go whoa, whoa, whoa sorry ah, so even the voice it just puts important. me off a little bit yeah mm. it really puts me off and i've done recently actually last christmas um we did uh we actually did three gigs 
where but with a full orchestra of singing I know everyone's done it but I just like doing it um, Frank Sinatra and, oh, Chris, yeah. and Christmas songs the swing, swingy numbers yeah but, but Christmas tunes as well because it oh, was cool. just in the run up to Christmas yeah and um, it was absolutely gorgeous. It was an amazing treat to do it. It was incredible. Yeah. You've um, got the kind of voice that can thank you. sustain that thank as you. well. Thank Not you. everybody does. Everybody <laughs> wants to do it. Yeah, well... But there's a certain charisma that you need in the, in yeah. the timbre of your voice. Yeah, I, I, the thing is, I, I am a big fan of Sinatra. I definitely yeah. am. Um, I'm not like geeky over it where I can tell you every album he recorded and all of that but yeah. I am I've read a lot of the books about him and all yeah. the rest of it and da -da -da. and there's something about that dude yeah. that's never happened again I don't yeah. care who you are Michael Bublé does a very good job in mm -hmm. that world and everything and all the rest of it well they signed but, him but, to 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 do the standards and right you know yeah reinvigorate that yeah that publishing catalogue right and um, because he's young and he's good looking, yeah, he's yeah. got something similar in the, yeah. in the way he sings. Yeah, and he's a great singer. There's no doubt about it. But I think it, he's but a good songwriter as well. Yeah, he has written some good tunes. Yeah. But I don't care who you are. Yeah, something strange, like with Elvis and like with various mm. other people, happened when that person was born. Mm. It, his voice is just like, what the hell's going on there? Mm. And yeah, I love singing them, and. I think I'm okay at it, and I think do you, you know. Apply an affectation to your voice. I and try, try and not do to. I try to thing. sing it in my way of singing. Because I which, find it uh, whenever I've tried to do anything. Because I'm a massive fan of Scott Walker. Oh wow! And sometimes okay. when I'm like writing stuff, and I'm trying, like, yeah. I, I'm trying to imagine like what would Scott Walker do, and then wow. it's impossible to not do a Scott Walker affectation when you're singing it. Mm. It just doesn't sound anything like me, mm. so it's unusable. Right? Okay. <laughs> so it's like yeah, I but just then you if could you, have uh, a. You could have like an alter ego thing and go and do something yeah. that's like, what is that? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I'd love but to I, do that actually. Well, I think, I don't know about you, but I definitely feel that I've just pinched stuff, outright pinched stuff from singers <laughs> over the years it's when so I was a kid. It's that you admit that. No, it's but great. because, and I don't even think it's always conscious, mm. but it's like, I just love the way, and I've spoken to some friends about this. When, when I was, a, I'm 57, so when I was a kid, um, I first started um, not even well yeah first first band I got in I was a drummer actually mm -hmm. so I played drums but I sang a bit as well because I'd always sung at school in the choirs and different you know and what what kind of music was was the band playing that you well playing we were like in? well Jeff the bass player loved Joy Division so oh, we right. we did a couple of their songs I loved the Police Stuart were you Copeland. doing like a lot of 16 oh it's all going on yeah. it's tiring like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does it is. yeah yeah <laughs> And I loved the police, cause yeah. of, cause, just because I loved the police. But so Stuart nothing Copeland, on the one. It's all weird. I mean, I used yeah. to sing So Lonely and play the drums to it, which is a bit odd. Wow. But once you've got over the thing, yeah. I don't know how good it was, so but the I did so, it. So the kick drum is land on yeah, the snare. Yeah, because the kick is on the snare, isn't it? Because it's, apart from when you get into the chorus, I think, and then it goes back to rock, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I know Black, black. You know what I mean? It does yeah. that then. But yeah. in the... the Ding, ding. No, it's, that's stuff difficult. It, it, yeah. yeah, but anyway, I, I, I managed it in my own way, whatever yeah. way that was. And um, drums and singing, wow. No, but it's it's. I still do it a tiny bit with some friends, actually, in a little mad midlife crisis rock band. But anyway, we're not going <laughs> we're to the best that kind. right now. Um, All rock bands are midlife crisis rock bands, is that even right? if they're in their twenties. Okay, <laughs> I've, I've been. Mine's lasted for the last twenty okay. years. Actually, so. <laughs> not a midlife crisis. I think I had my midlife crisis in my twenties, so yeah. that, that suits. Um, a lot of singers think that, don't they? I think, yeah, Is it because maybe. you have a cataclysmic change in your probably, lifestyle. Yeah, with mine, it probably was, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I think going back to the singing thing and, and pinching stuff, I think like when I go back to a lot of the bands that were it, it, like mainstream pop things as well, but also some more alternative, slightly out there stuff. Yeah, everyone kind of sang with an affected voice, mm. really. Um, it, it was it was there was a lot of baritone about for yeah. one thing yeah, a yeah. lot of it and like if you think of like Edwin Collins you know um, um, Orange Juice and yeah. what have you and the sort of style of his voice which is a bit Elvis come, come what have you you yeah. know and I mean that as a compliment by the way um, we used to sing um, Rip It Up and Start Again that was one of oh, our yeah. covers that we did cool and um, but there's a lot of people who did that so it wasn't I think the way I ended up singing I liked a lot of black American music definitely mm. I've got two older brothers and an older sister, so I was force fed all the music they loved and everything, which was really widespread from like um, uh, like progressive rock, even going into like Rick Wakeman progressive rock, if yeah. you know what I mean, and all those albums and all of that. Like Synthesizer players with just lots of different keyboards oh, yeah. and a cape. Yeah, a cape. <laughs> so important. Um, we, we 
we went to see Rick, my, my sister and eldest brother went to see him a few times on ice and everything kind of thing. <laughs> um, and when he he was going to play um, outside Hampton Court Palace I and do there. that, you went to that. Yeah. So so I I I, I bought the Henry um, VIII stuff. Wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, six Wives of Henry VIII. I know this is very flash, but I went online and bought bought twelve tickets. I think because I knew immediately. I'd have to like invite my brothers and my sister, yeah. their partners, and a couple of friends. Mm. So we all went, and we just—it was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, mad, yes. mad as can possibly be. Yeah. And also, because do, do, I don't know how many what nights. A venue. Yeah. It's, <laughs> but yeah. all the seating was like seemed like it was a hundred miles. I mean, I've got poor eyesight, and I couldn't oh, see. Right. Okay. Couldn't really yeah. see the magic. Well, well, that we live really close to Hampton Court. I sort of walk past it every day on a walk, kind of thing. Yeah. And in. I've done gigs there, and you play in the quadrant, in the in the what's it, in kind of in the sort of cosy what have you. Yeah. But he did the thing right out the front, didn't he? Where he walked out of the gates, the mm. huge big gates, and he had Brian Blessed. Do you remember that? He announced oh, it. Shit, I didn't yeah. remember that. No, yeah, 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 he did. Love Brian Blessed. Yeah. He came on and did the whole. And somebody, I don't know whether he did a couple of nights, so I don't know whether at the same night, I don't know, or maybe it was one. But at one point, somebody kept shouting. Um, something about you know you've got to do the gordon bit gordon's alive right and in the end <laughs> i he hope said, that wasn't me shouting okay. <laughs> it was when i was so yeah, maybe. <laughs> but in the end he did it anyway so oh, which really? was pretty amazing. That's amazing yeah but um Crowd yeah so, so so i've i've sort of i i grew up listening to a lot of different stuff um and really loving a lot of things and not really finding my own music that i like just because i had music constantly yeah. being played in someone's bedroom or in the living but room. isn't that how influence works though? I mean, it's kind of like you're yeah. pulling, you know, you, you assemble your tool set yeah. based on the things that you've enjoyed consuming. I guess, I guess, but I never really learned to play anything as a kid. We always had a piano in the house. My mum mm. uh, my mum and dad are both passed now, but my mum was like a pretty amazing piano player. Mm. Um, could sight read like classical and wow. everything. Um, but I didn't grow up with my mum. I grew up uh, with my, my, it's a long story, but they got divorced and we all ended up staying at what was eventually my dad's house kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But there was still a piano there, saw my mum every day. Mm. And, but I just never took to the idea of wanting to learn to play the piano, mm. which I hate now because mm. I'd love to have all that kind of theory and I can get on a piano and, you know. Theory is something that you absorb <clears throat> just by doing it. And I think, the, right. but the problem of it is vocabulary. Okay, you know, like, so, interesting. Because I think, I think I've, my understanding of theory is, you know, it's improved so much over the last few years, but right. I still don't have the right way of expressing it right, so okay. to another person that understands theory, yeah. you know. So I kind yeah. of get it, but it's just like, I'm, I'm often I'm saying the wrong stuff. Well, it's interesting because I don't get any of it. And I, <laughs> I actually, I, sure I you do. well, well, I, I don't. Um, no, I don't. And what happens is <laughs> I have a studio at home in my garage and it's a nice garage. It's not a garage anymore. No. And I've made my own albums in there and I've played everything, like literally every note of it. Mm. But I had no idea how. <laughs> and that's not false modesty. That's just honesty. So that's just your ear and finding Yeah, and I think it's pretty simple stuff that I do. It's nothing like, you know, there's no jazz chords in there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And there's no kind of, it's pretty do much. You know what, if, I, if I could have suggest one thing if you want to sound like a cool piano player yeah and this is a good tip for people at home if you like the triad chord is the root and right. the third and the fifth yeah as soon as you put the ninth in it makes you sound like a real piano player okay on every chord okay because it can be major or minor it's neither and if you take that one off then this is a good point to start a melody because then you can you have to choose up or down to guide you you see you see this is this is a very interesting thing right and i'm i'm gonna do that as soon as i get home now i've just decided <laughs> but, but this you is try a, try a d and put an e in it, it just okay well this is very interesting time. because um i may do some of that occasionally mm. without knowing it yeah and i don't but the thing is the moment you start saying um put a ninth in it or what have you mm -hmm. there's something in my head that just goes to spaghetti ah it's really weird. It, it, I just instantly go, ooh. And I, I thought and you were going to say that the magic disappears, but it... I wouldn't say it's... No, no, just I don't... Th no, in. I don't think... Yeah, it's a bit of that. I think it's a bit of inferiority complex and a bit of like, I don't know what he's talking about, so let's just move on to something else. Mm. And, and, and the guys that I work with, you know, the girls and the guys in the band and everything are all like 
phenomenal players yeah. and astounding well, and can do anything and play anything all the rest of it yeah but they don't they don't actually have to in my universe because it's not that difficult to play my stuff right. there's a few some of the stock at Kim Walkmans are quite nifty in terms of the yeah. key changes and what they go to and it does surprise people like, when they do a key change is it often a semi up the, the Steely Wonder you know what? I've never even thought about what they are, but there's a few. There's a few like one of the, one of my. I think it was second single. I think whenever you need somebody, it's called anyway. Mm -hmm. It's got some weird sort of changes, and even to sing it when they played it to me, I went, "What?" And I was trying to follow Mike Stock, who used to do the vocals and yeah. everything. I'm like, w w "Where have you just gone? How the hell did you get to that note?" And he had to kind of tap it out almost. On a piano and say that really is the melody. It's really difficult if the note starts on a one, or, or it's even worse if it's before a one, because then you have to anticipate the change. Don't right? You? Okay. Yes. Yeah. You know, you almost need to be singing in that key. Yeah. If it's a two or, or three, or that, of, yeah, you know, yeah. Then you're off. Yeah. It, it, it's it's obviously really clever when people just hit it straight straight out of the game. Yeah. Isn't it? Some people are annoying. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I've sung, I've sung, for instance, that song so many times. I don't even think about it now. Mm. But if I do, let's say I'm somewhere. Do you think that's we, muscle memory. Yeah, I think it is a lot of it. And I think sometimes, like, if I've been to do a TV abroad somewhere where you're going to sing with a house band or something, you know, and they've got a great band and all that, and you just jump up and do it. Mm. Quite often they've said to me after, they sort of said, that tune, man, there's some weird, what's going on there? <laughs> because they view the Stock Aitken Walkman thing, mm. kind of rightly so, as a bit cutty-cutter and a bit mm -hmm. like this, that, and the other. Mm. But when they've actually had to play one, they've gone, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so... It's interesting. Well, they produced know. a load of stuff in the 80s, yeah, didn't yeah, just, they? Just like the tons of it. Defined the sound of 80s. A little bit. Really. Certainly the British kind of, you know, yeah. pop thing, definitely, yeah. Yeah. So. Well, they, didn't they do, they did Dead or Alive as well. Which they is did, like which is just, edgy. I mean, I made tea on that album. Did you? Yeah, because I, I signed to their little production, production company because they weren't known. When, when I signed to them, I had no clue who they were. Mm. They, they just had a studio in London and they'd made a few singles mm. and they'd had some records that, you know, I went, I think I know what that is, mm. but not like a genuine kind of like boom, number one smash. Mm. And, I, and I signed this tiny little deal with them for no money or anything, just to kind of like, I'll, make, I'll get to live in London for a week and, mm -hmm. or two days uh, and do a track. And then cut a long story short, they had the first single that was massive, which was um, Say I'm Your Number One by Princess, which I think was a number one record. And like a few weeks later, they'd been working on the Dead or Alive You Spin Me Around track. Mm -hmm. Boom, number one again. And, and that, was, like, that was 1985, wasn't it? Something like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I ended up basically anyway, um, becoming like a T-boy, tape hop, whatever you want to call it, dog's body in the studio. And there's a bunch of other kids Did there. Did they have a nickname for you? Git, probably. <laughs> I when I used know. to do that sort of thing, they used to call me Plimsoll. Oh, really? I have no idea oh, why. Wow. Plimsoll. Yeah, Plimsoll. Okay. The T boy. Wow. Where was that then? Uh, a place called um, Purple Rain Studios in Galston. Oh, my God. And there was a band from up, up north somewhere, and they said, uh, I'm going to get some sweets for the lad. <laughs> <laughs> they killed me Plimsoll. Fantastic. And everyone just called me Plimsoll. Sweet foot lad. Lovely. <laughs> Get some sweet spot lad. <laughs> Amazing. Um, but yeah. yeah, so then then they got stuck into making that album. And and I was just hanging around, literally just kind of hanging around mm -hmm. and became one of the studio kids. Mm. So I made tea and played table tennis with them all. Mm. Just did what you did in the studio when, well, you know, you know. And yeah. um, so it was pretty amazing to be around at that time with those guys, the Stock AQ Mortimer guys, because... A lot of what they did also wasn't kind of repetitive. It did sound slightly, well, not slightly, it sounded very different. Mm. The Princess record and Dead or Alive is completely mm. different. They're like chalk and cheese almost. They're still pop records. They're still made in that way of using keyboards on a drum machine, but so was pretty much everyone else in pop music yeah, yeah. at that point. And the guitar had become a bit of a thing you have in a cupboard because it looks nice. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting that out. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It yeah, was a bit like that, you know. Yeah. Um, and so... I always That stuff always sounds really sequenced and accomplished and then yeah. and when you get like um you get into the 90s and everyone had atari S atari sts i suppose and we're trying right. to do like cubase and stuff yeah there'd always be glitches on the fourth bar when it comes back to the first right. it'd be like slightly late and you'd Interesting. almost imperceptibly late but it's it used to really the timing of it isn't and i was it? always yeah. going how the fuck does stock yeah. and a woman do it yeah well, they had a Lin 9000 and they never used anything else ever. What's a, what's a Lin, Lin 9000 was a Lin drum, but it was, it was, I think it was like second or third generation from the one that everyone covered so much, which is right. the sort of black and gold, brownie, purple, okay. uh, orangey one kind so of thing. Is that a sequencer just for the drums or is it for. It, it was drums, but you also sequenced 
keyboard parts in it as well. And, and it was quite a big MIDI or like an early form. Yeah, it would be MIDI. Yeah, and they only had. They probably only had like, I mean, they had anything they wanted, obviously, by the time they'd started making Josh and everything. And they yeah. bought a um, Fairlight eventually. Okay. And they had a guy called Ian Kerno, who's genius of a guy. Um, and he became their programmer. And it was a bit of a universe that opened when they did that because mm. I Ian had sort of like, you know, toured with Talk Talk and lots of other a bit mm. more kind of, you know, left field things as opposed to, but loved pop music and had a good sense of all of it. And so he'd be in there programming string parts and keyboard parts and all kinds of things that that wouldn't necessarily be what I think anyway. Well, I'm saying that you'd have to ask Matt and Mike Stock and Aiken. Mm. But I think for me, when they did the Never Gonna Give You Up record, because Ian had done all those strings and those brass things and everything, not taking anything away from Stock at Hugh Morton, um, there was something about that that was a little bit different to what perhaps they would have done. Mm. And I think that really what do you think the difference was it made it, you, well, I think, were, and I'm not even saying they didn't say to him look we're after like a Philadelphia string thing or something yeah. I don't know what you know but I'm just saying it's just another musician mm. it's yeah, not the same two guys because Pete Walkman as much as he knows about music and was a driving force in it is not like somebody who got in the room and got on the keys and started right. doing all of that you know? do you feel like um, do you feel like Pete Waterman has tarnished his legacy by doing all that TV stuff I don't know what his it's legacy is. Thing for you to yeah, say. I don't know what his legacy is really, and I think I think it. it well, I, I sometimes think about him, and I, I think like if he hadn't positioned positioned himself as a judge. Yeah. You know. Yes, I know. Casting, what you, mean. you know, yeah. deciding kind yeah. of votes on people's careers and I know dreams, even if he'd just been like, yeah, if he'd just been a guy that made the, all those, yeah, yeah, yeah. iconic. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. I think I think there's a lot of people who suddenly have a different um, door open up. Hmm and don't necessarily think too much about it mm. and i think he he quite likes well i'm saying that i don't know about now but I, think, I think i think he did yeah <laughs> i think he did yeah. and i think he liked being the mouthpiece of that organization and the whole yeah. thing and like and i think to his credit without him being like that i don't know where they would have got to because the talent was there but it's you like know, maybe, maybe i'm kind of triggered by pete waterman because there was a time when one of the contestants sang our hit, oh. you know and then he said stuff like, uh, you really made that your own. That's the definitive verse. It's, it's a gimmicky song. I was like, I've never heard anyone slag off a song that one of the contestants is singing. It's like, if you don't like the song, don't fucking ask me if you can use it on the TV program yeah. and then slag it weird. off. And yeah, then I saw, him, I saw him backstage at one, uh, the Irish, some Irish oh, awards right, okay. ceremony. And I was wearing a jacket which had a lot of tassels on the back. Right. And it was all scaffolding because it was, you know, an awards ceremony. Right. None of it was real. Right. And um, I was standing there talking to the guy at Def Leppard and Kerry Catone and okay. then Pete Woman comes along. I tried to blank him, but my right. tassels were stuck in the <laughs> scaffolding. Oh, and fantastic. I was stuck there like a, you know, so like you a, couldn't turn away. caught in a web. Oh my God. And I just had to be nice to him because that's oh, what well. I do you know? okay that's what you do <laughs> so yeah but anyway yeah. I suppose I I just kind of wish sometimes that people who have made that kind of impact on, mm. on an entire decade sound yeah would just not go on the telly yeah and say mean stuff about my song no no well <laughs> listen that, no I, I think the thing is when people are mean or, or say mm. derogatory things and what have you a lot of the time it's just their stick it's just like yeah. i can't just sit here and go yeah lovely do you know what i mean especially yeah. in that show you know what i mean pop idol i think is what you're referring yeah, but, to uh, in it but i wasn't a contestant no it was my song come on let's go and get him i know where he lives <laughs> yeah, okay you hold him back <laughs> <laughs> um yeah no listen i mean as much as i have a soft spot for Pete and mm. for matt and mike i haven't seen matt for donkey's years but i bumped into mike a couple of times i still have a feeling of without them i don't know whether i'd be sat here talking to you right. i don't know whether i would have done x y and z mm -hmm. and so i'm not going to defend them in the sense of that or certainly pete in terms of what he said about yeah. your no, tune and what no no Honestly, i'm serious I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I think i only mentioned it because you're bitter i wanted yeah i am embittered <laughs> and old and i just wanted to I think I just wanted to have said it so that it contextualizes yeah. any. Got it. You know, just to be in the, in the name of open. Dialogue. Yeah, yeah. No, I've got it. I've yeah. got it. No, listen. He's a, the thing is, he is. He's different. There's mm. no doubt about it. Mm. And like I say, from from the kind of A and R mouthpiece perspective, mm. somebody had to be out there. So, what was his him. role in Stock Aitken and Waterman? Then? He'd, very he like often, he'd, he'd very often come up with the title and the mm. idea of the song ah. and say, "Look, this artist." 
needs to be singing something like this and he oh, very often so it's very, like an A&R almost very much so and he'd very often say well see this record and he wouldn't be sat there telling you exactly why in terms of I'm saying that I'm, I'm about Matt and Mike really mm. or let's say Phil one of the guys who mixed a lot of their stuff mm. he'd be saying listen the reason this works is this percussion mm. I'm not bothered about the whatever it was the snare drum or the way it's the top bit that's making it that's the bit or even if he didn't know that mm. or couldn't necessarily verbalize that mm. he'd be able to paint in colors or whatever and say mm. this is what i want it to be like i want it to be like this uh -huh. and someone would do a version of it and mix it in the building or what have you and he'd go no and he'd bring the record down that he was referring or maybe three records and he'd go that and somebody who was musically technically whatever would say oh he means yeah. this. So that person would then say, oh, he's talking about this frequency range. All of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and it would be very often, I think, he just had an idea for something and he'd look at an artist who we're about to work with or they'd just been given the gig of doing something with or someone they found or whatever and go, nope, we're not having any of that. It's got to be more this than that. Do you know what I mean? Or, yeah. you know. So it was very A and R what he did, I think, and Matt and Mike were the musicians. They they were like seriously &R, good musicians. That's, that's actually in the days when <clears throat> A and R meant something. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Because I, I was going to ask you when you when you started working mm. as a T boy, mm. what was your ambition? I mean, presumably it wasn't to be an engineer. Or was, no, was, no, were I, you was, still I was like signed as a singer. Right. I mean, I'd, he'd he'd seen me in a band in a little town where I'm from up north. Hmm. On like a little show. Which town is that, by the way? It's called Newton Le Willows. Doesn't that sound it posh? Box, it does, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it ain't. Okay. Um, it's actually all right. If you drive it's down, a working men's club in there. Oh, there's a few, yeah. Oh, yeah. there were, there were. They're probably gone now. But if you drive down the high street of Newton Le Willows, it's quite nice, actually. It is. It's like, mm. oh, this is quite quaint, you know. It's probably pedestrianised by now, though. No, it's not. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Still a motorway. Um, but it's it's. When I was growing up there as a kid, it was quite a tough area because it's mm. it's sort of dead centre in the middle from Liverpool to Manchester. Mm -hmm. It's Wigan, St. Helens, Warrington. It's very, very working class and very, you know. But in lots of ways, it's not a bad place to be in a little band mm. because pubs, I'm sure everywhere, by the way, did. But I'm saying in that, that era, you could, you could get a gig in a pub as a 16-year-old. We weren't allowed to, yeah. but 16, 17-year-old, you know. Mm -hmm. So... And we built a little following there and we this, that and the other. We entered into a few Battle of the Bands. Mm -hmm. One, we completely, you know, got murdered and it was a, a mess. But we learned from it and then we won one. Yeah, because right. I, cause I was starting writing songs by then. So I thought, no, nope, we've got the catchiest song you can possibly... I don't care what the lyrics are. I don't care anything about it. We've got three minutes or whatever it was to get someone to go, what is that? Mm. So one of the songs was called Shake Your Ass, of course. Brilliant. And I'd like, I had so these that, massive that would big, still be a hit. So of course it would. And I had these massive big yellow tom toms that I used to beat. <laughs> and Chris was on drums because we had a drummer by then. Second band this was. Um, what am I on about? Why am I saying? Oh, Waterman. <laughs> so Pete Waterman came to see that band in a showcase. And I actually seem to remember, I think he was at one of the Battle of the Bands uh, um, trial things that we yeah. did or whatever. And he came to see us and he kind of liked my voice but didn't want to work with the band. That wasn't what his Ooh. thing. He wasn't interested really in musicians and mm. all of that, you know. You had enough of those. Too noisy, you know. Mm. Um, and so, and I was a bit, I didn't know whether I wanted to do that. But I also thought, literally, and I've said this before, I literally thought, he has got a jag and he's got red leather pants. Oh. So. But what cut? Were they tight? They weren't super tight, no. So like a voluminous... I'd never seen red leather pants. Cut. I'd seen them on... Oh, what, a generous cut? A generous cut. A generous cut. <laughs> I'd seen them on TV. Hmm. I've never been near any. Who would be... I mean, I suppose... Trying to think who would wear red leather pants in Rod the Stewart. early... Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart, of course. Or, or someone of that ilk. Or anybody from the Stones. He wouldn't have a generous cut, though. You'd be able oh, no, to see it. would have been nothing vein. generous about that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the opposite. Yeah. No, yeah. but you know what I mean? It was, it was, it was like, okay... This is, you know, and he's got a studio in London with some other guys and they want to do this, that and the was other. Was the upholstery of the jag also leather? And did it squeak when he it got was, in and out of the car? It, it was leather. It had to be leather. I don't think they yeah. did a jag that wasn't leather. Unless Great it was, if it was just, red leather interior as oh, well as, yeah. You disappear into it. You, they're probably, the jag, the pants were probably made by jag as well. Of course. You know, lovely. XJS, was it? It was, it was a, it was a, no, uh, It was a 
an XJ6, I think is what it used to be called, which ah. is the saloon. Okay. It's the gentleman's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Did he drive it himself or was someone oh, driving it? Oh no, he drove it, it. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So he actually picked me up in it to go down to London with his- Were your parents concerned at any point that no, there was a man his, in his middle of the pace picking girl, you up His girlfriend in was in the car okay, at the time. That's cool, yeah, right. um, <clears throat> and not that that would have changed anything, but who knows? <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> Oh, where witness. are we going with this? Anyway, <laughs> so we go down to London and um, yeah, basically I, I was signed to, to be a singer and, mm. and that was the deal and they were gonna, they wanted to kind of develop their own artists. Mm. And I think the thing just took off for them doing people's, like the Dead or Alive thing, which was such a big record that yeah. it was massive. Huge. And I think it was a turning point definitely for them, but even possibly, dare I say, within British pop music at that moment of like, what is that? It's so kind of like, yeah, it, it was like, it, it, it just had this sound that people were going, and obviously, therefore, labels started going, we'd like one of those, please. Yeah. Obviously, we don't have a Pete Burns, we don't have it, you know, but mm. we want, we want. What a and voice so they, he had. Yeah. And so they just got inundated. And so myself and maybe one or two other people they had signed, I don't really know, I can't remember that actually, but um, we just got put on the back burner. But in a way, it was an apprenticeship. So I used yeah. to do my demos on an SSL desk, which they, they bought very s soon after the massive Dead or Alive thing. I think they were trying to get one and got, anyway, it doesn't matter, but yeah. they had one at one point. Mm -hmm. So at the weekends, I'd be doing demos using their keyboards. On a fancy And the one SSL Tokai thing. Strat that they had, by the way, that was the only guitar they had in the building. It was a nice one, but it was the only guitar they had in the building. Um, and, um, and using their sounds and everything. Wow. So all those sounds and all the things that was, <clears throat> do you remember like a DX7 had a cartridge that you programmed sounds and all that and you could... Let me show you a tattoo. Oh. Which arm is it on? Sorry, Rick, this is, there's the big reveal. Oh my God, why, that's amazing. But <laughs> let me ask you why. Yeah, why not? That's the answer okay, to Okay, why not? Um, <clears throat> I think because F, FM synthesis it's particularly good at bass sounds and stuff with, yeah. a, with, a, with a lot of attack. Yeah. Chromatic percussion stuff, it's the way those algorithms work, the old fashioned algorithms, not yeah. the ones they use on social media. Sure. Um, I just think they're, it's unrivaled for a certain type of thing. And it's something that was very prevalent in. But listen, I'm, I'm, I don't even know how to say this exactly, but obviously you, you're, you are now not, and your band obviously, for being very rock and very guitar led and very real. And the DX7 synthesizer, as much as I love the history of it as well, and yeah. I've got a, a, a kind of a, you know, if I see one, I go a bit wobbly. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Because it, it was the, the coveted, piece of, yeah, yeah, it was the coveted thing to have. Yeah. Um, and it's all over my early, you know, those 80 mm. records. But I'm looking at you going and what I know of you and seen of you. I'm going, I don't equate that. I don't understand that. Right. If you if you had like a flaming Gibson there or something, which I'm sure you have somewhere, but you know what I mean. I, I no, can understand actually, that. I haven't got any guitars oh. tattooed oh, wow. on. Yet. I'm going into Yet. some tomorrow, so you go, maybe I'll address that. But do you know what I mean? You know, yeah. that, if somebody would have said, name name an instrument or the name of an instrument that Justin might have tattooed, <laughs> that would not. That would <laughs> come about. I'd, yeah. be, I'd be into the... I, I, I just love synthesizers. Oh, really? You do? Is, that, for what that does, there's interesting. nothing else like it, yeah. FM wow. synthesis is really interesting to me. Why? Because I'm a okay. nerd, you know. Okay, so, well, there you go, then you'll like this then, and you probably know all this shit anyway, but... Um, they, the Stock Ecking Walkman guys, mm. used to use a piano as well as the bass sound from a, the, the, it was the piano from it, but also right. the bass sounds. Yeah. And they had these cartridges that they programmed things, uh, programmed the sounds and everything. Mm -hmm. And those were more, um, what should I say, they were like protected than the keyboard. The right. keyboard was a bit like, well, anyone can get oh, all, all, all the those. patches are on the thing. Are yeah. they the hot swappable ones yes. that you stick in the back? Yeah, yeah. And like, because they knew they had like three or four rooms, I think. And yeah. so I think they just took the cartridge down or, or whatever it was called, you know, about that big, weren't and they? And they, they probably yeah. put it in a safe. Well, I'm not joking. I think somebody had all, you know, you know, but, and I think we were allowed to use all the sounds, I think. Mm. But like, if anyone was seen taking that out of the building, I'm not joking, they'd be dragged over hot coals. Yeah. It was a big deal, you know. Yeah. And, and that was one of the things they did, by the way. They put a piano underneath the bass sound as well. Mm -hmm. And that was how it was so percussive and so, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, so. yeah. So have the, you got the a DX7? I have, yeah. Right, yeah. okay, amazing. Yeah. More, more than one, actually. Oh, my Only God. Only one of them works, but yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. I would have never have, that, but there you go. No, you there's something, something about, like, for an up-tempo number, mm. 
like those those bass sounds they hit you mm. more quickly than a traditional I, mean, I think bass frequencies travel a bit slower anyway right so to have that sort of percussive end to it yeah you know the envelope's just a bit more I don't know I just find it more mm. satisfying somehow yeah if you're trying to play a guitar along to it right interesting yeah. interesting not it doesn't ever make it onto a darkness record but then you know my uh, maybe my musical existence is multifaceted you know. well it's it's also a bit of a weird one because it's it's so you hear that thing that keyboard mm. and you can't help but it, I'm not saying if you're not interested in musical sounds of the what yeah but anybody who's ever heard that thing mm. you can't unhear it <laughs> so if you hear it on a record mm. and it's sort of come back in vogue and fashion and everything in this last 10 12 15 mm. years whatever where there's so many 80s keyboard sounds and stuff on things mm. um but that one in particular i think there's certain sounds within it and things that it does that you just go oop and that's you know if we had time to derobe and if it wasn't so cold <laughs> i'd show you um, i've got all the dx7 algorithms on my shot are you serious yeah yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> this is interesting okay yeah <clears throat> wow yeah. that's fascinating no but can you understand where i'm coming from that that's the last thing i would have thought yeah i get it yeah yeah wow man that's really interesting <laughs> so when you did the glastonbury oh yeah thing last yeah. year do you know yeah. what i thought i'm gonna posit a theory as to why it was so successful okay. and li tell me what you think so i think the songs that you did are, are you talking about the Smiths thing? Or are I'm you talking, talking about, about the Blossom Smiths Okay, Smith yeah, yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. I reckon those are songs that everybody knows and loves. Yeah. But the person that sang them originally has become such a divisive figure that it's taken the enjoyment away from that material. And then when you come up there, you're not a divisive figure. You are a person that everyone was really happy to see on the stage, like brightened up the weekend. And then did all those brilliant songs. Right. It was a fucking amazing moment. And I think it's because it, I think that for a lot of people, that catalogue suddenly became accessible and it was okay to like it again. What do you think of that theory? Um, it's difficult for me to even talk about it, partly because... Um, you were so drunk at the time. I was so drunk at the time. No, no, I am quite sensitive to it in the sense that I was a massive massive i still am by the way i say mm. i was i mean mm. when they were a band yeah, in and the they moment were, it, you were, yeah 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 my older brother mike uh got me into the smiths first he he bought first album i think and was playing it a lot at home and it is a bit kind of like it pricks your ears up straight away and there's one or two songs that you instantly you're in and yeah. then there's other ones where you go that's gonna take me a minute to get my head around mm -hmm. that um but i was kind of fascinated by them as well and I kind of absolutely loved the fact they were from Manchester, which yeah, is where yeah. I went to buy jeans and T-shirts and records mm -hmm. and just be in Manchester because it was a proper city and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, and so is Liverpool, by the way. But with my accent, I probably would have got beaten up in Liverpool yeah. back then. Not today because the times yeah. have changed, but an accent was enough to get you in a fight, you know, so we didn't go to Liverpool. Um, so I really... So anyway, so when I met Blossoms... Uh, which was when the arena in Manchester reopened. Um, they had a lineup, and, and uh, Noel Gallagher was the headline. Um, they had a lot of bands from the Manchester area come and play. <clears throat> I'm not from Manchester, but I snuck in. I've got a letter. I was allowed to play. Eh. So anyway, so we did our thing, and and um, Cortina's played. Lo loads of really great bands played. So Noel was really lovely and very gracious and he just kind of flung his door open and said everyone in mind for a beer if you want to you know so come in my room so we all did so i was just chatting to these you know and i didn't really know blossoms i knew of them i knew one or two tunes because they've had some big tunes but i didn't know them know them you know what i mean and we're chatting and then a week or so later i did their podcast funnily enough and um we just had a really good chat and a good everything and we started talking about being a kid and bands and everything and I mentioned the Smiths and they were a bit taken aback by that mm. that I would like the Smiths even mm. and they are really big Smiths fans which I find staggering because they weren't even alive right right and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that but I'm just saying it still takes me back a little bit mm. so I think us doing it we kind of when I went up to their rehearsal place because basically I said to them, look, I've always had this weird dream. Well, one day I'm just going to go and do a gig of Smith songs. Wow. I said, I've always wanted to do that, even though I've been in bands myself when I was a kid and, da -da -da, and had my own career as a pop singer and all the rest of it. But in your dream, was it 
was it Glastonbury? No, it would have just been specifically no, a festival. it would have been a little uh, just a venue. It yeah. didn't really matter. A big pub will do. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. A venue. I just want to go and sing because I have sung those songs yeah. throughout my life. Yeah. I built a shed in lockdown. I quite like getting physical with things, right? Yeah. So slate roof, by the way. You know what I mean? Not to be sneezed at. This is that's, a proper shed. Yeah, a real so undertaking. Anyway, <clears throat> and one of the things I did in lockdown was I went through artists' careers that I really like, and I'd go from song one right the way through. Mm. So I'd just have my headphones in, and I'd be singing along in the back garden kind of thing. And I kind of just found myself going through the Smiths catalogue quite a bit, mm -hmm. and I just love those songs. Mm. I love Morris's voice. Mm. I think he's quite underrated as a singer. People talk well. about his lyrics all the time, and, and rightfully so. Yeah. And obviously the band as a as a as a thing, you know, as an entity or whatever. But he as a singer is pretty amazing, I think. Yeah. Um, and I love singing those tunes. So anyway, so I said this to the Blossoms guys, and a little while later, this you know they got back in touch and said, "Well, we've been thinking about it. We'll be the band." And I said to Tom, you know, lead singer, I said, well, do you want to sing some? And he's like, no, nah, no, we'll just be the band, you know. It's I'm like, awesome. okay. So we did a couple of gigs, one in Manchester, one in London, and it was just amazing. But when we did the first run, it wasn't even a rehearsal. It was like a jam just to see how, what, who, how could we, what have you. We all, I'm not saying we normally burst into tears, but it was like, mm. it was emotional. Mm. It was like, we, one of the songs we did was please, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. And once you start that song if you're a fan it, it's very um, filled with emotion that I think yeah. and um, so I don't know so I find it a bit weird to even think about us doing it even though we've done it mm. it's a bit like what the it's like you manifested that somehow like, I mean, not well, at the risk of sounding like a intolerable hippie no hey. well I, I, I don't hey. disagree I don't disagree with you I don't disagree with you yeah because you've I, dreamt it and then yeah, you made it happen uh, yeah um, in a really spectacular way. Well, I've got to give credit to the guys because they're not easy tunes at all. Well, I wanted to ask you actually, when um, so when Blossoms and you did that, mm. was that their slot, or was it something that you got booked because of the two shows you'd done in Manchester? Yeah, we and did London? the we did the shows Manchester and London, and there was a bit of chatter about it, and like, are they going are they going to do that again? It was it just like a mad weekend? Yeah. Was it you know? And I just want to just put this on cards on the table while we're at a card table, as it were. Um, I, I was like, even if we never do this, if we just go in this room and do it, mm. I'm all right with that. Mm. Just us getting together and playing those tunes yeah. and singing those amazing songs was kind of enough, really. Yeah. And then it was, but it was just, I think the people who, you know, are around them management wise and myself and everybody that, you know, we all, you know, just went, you should go and, this, you should go and do it somewhere. Mm. So we did a venue in Manchester and one in London and it was just amazing. The emotion of it and the feeling of it was incredible. And we I came bet everybody in the room was screaming along. Well, that's the other thing. And it, and it goes back to what you asked me and when, when you brought this up is everyone in that room, word for word, knew it. Mm. Some people were 14. Mm. and then there's people a bit older than me like in their 60s mm -hmm. and there was no difference when I looked in people's eyes of why they were singing those songs I'm getting emotional about it now actually yeah, yeah. It's, it's like and, and on I the thought one, it was beautiful <coughs> I, like, thank when you, I said to you, thank when you, you when you walked in here I said that you'd won the summer <laughs> I genuinely <laughs> believe you. that if thank you well, well, one of my was, favourite things that I covered all thank last you. year actually well I think partly because it was so um, a bit odd to think that me you know that guy is with that those guys and they're gonna even do so anything you together are so detached from your career that you see that as odd yeah i do see it as odd yeah and you know when you're talking about <laughs> let's circle back to um sinatra yeah is morrissey one of the singers that you think has influenced you as a, as a vocalist um i definitely think he's influenced me in his um i'm gonna try in and his, come uh, up with the right the way word. He, um, the way he's, he swings a bouquet yeah, possibly um, it's no it's more it's like he's got it's melodrama is that the right way yeah. so he, he, okay. he doesn't yeah, yeah. he doesn't just sing mm. the goddamn thing mm. it's almost like I'm not saying he's acting but, but he's emoting like, though, isn't yeah it? and there's like a real persona on that stage mm -hmm. and, and to be fair I mean yeah it's very difficult because of a lot of people aren't um, as you said, they, they don't want to go and perhaps see him do that and all him at all because of things he said. And you know, I, I understand that. And I just separate the two things. Yeah. I just sort of say, Picasso made some incredible art. 
but evidently wasn't the nicest human being in the world mm. I'm not I'm not equating that to Morrissey that's a different kettle of fish I think also because to be honest I do think that's it's not something anybody should be allowed to hide behind but being really creative being artistic is usually got demons in it somewhere mm. and w w some way it, that is also part of creating something mm. so amazing is because it's it's a but struggle you've never to said anything abhorrent obnoxious and <laughs> Well, I mean, you probably have, but I mean, <laughs> never, you know, as everybody um, probably has in jest, perhaps. At, but, you know, you, yeah. you, you haven't. No, but I, 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 I have got opinions on certain things for sure. Hmm. But I also don't think I would ever be somebody who, who people would go to for an opinion like that. I'm, I'm just going to take you back a little bit here. Yeah, right? here please go. do. Here we go. Let's rub so the table as we do so. Let's everybody. So reassuring. Not everybody. I, I, sorry, I, I say everybody. I don't mean everybody. There was a portion of people who absolutely hated Stock Hickey Mortimer and anybody who came out of their building, yeah. including me. Mm. And so they might have listened to Never Gonna Give You Up, not realized to produced it, not the whatever, and gone, is that a good pop song? Yeah, it's all right, or whatever. But the moment it becomes, oh, well, it's Stock Hickey Mortimer, he's a puppet, da -da -da, it's just all made in a, in a sausage machine and no, you know, yeah. it, it, was, it, was, it wasn't very nice. And every room I ever walked in, unless the other artists and people around the management and everybody were extremely pop like a real tv pop thing i'd walk into i'd kind of feel all right but if i ever went where there was like musicians hmm. i just think everyone in this room thinks i'm a twat wow and wants to fucking punch me wow honest to god and i think a lot of people i felt that in certain rooms because i think for a different reason. I mean, most people thought that my band was not a serious thing. You know, thought it was a joke band. Okay, I'm quite stunned to be hearing this. But go on, go yeah, on. I mean, it's, it's, a lot of people dismissed us as a industry plant joke type band. You know. Okay. So I get what you're saying, but I mean, I, I, I it's really cool that you're kind of like willing to address that, really, because I mean, is that? Yeah, but it, because it, because it's painful to go through, if I'm honest, yeah. and also because I, it, it, I fall into some weird slots, I think, in the sense that. As a kid, I played drums in a band for a few mm. years. I became a singer. I wrote songs. Mm. I just happened to meet Stock Aki Mortimer and mm. went, what the hell's this? And they said, look, kid, we write the songs. You just go and sit over there, right? Mm. And bizarrely, as it happened, I got four, four songs on that first album. And, oh, really? And like, quite a few on the second. Self-written ones, yeah. yeah. Wow. And that happened because... Sorry, we're going everywhere, aren't we? Yeah, it's good. Um, that happened because Pete Waterman wanted to sign me to like a proper label, a proper, you know, and cut a long story short, he chose RCA, went to see this guy called Peter Robinson, who's head of A&R, mm -hmm. and Peter was almost on the verge of signing me anyway, I think. He was like, well, you know, yeah, okay. These stock kicking Mormon guys seem to know, but he was kind of like, I'm going to have to hear him sing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right. So they hadn't recorded anything really. We'd done a couple of little things, but nothing, you know. So Pete... Waterman said to me, you know those little demos that you've got, which have done four track demos at home at mm. a friend's stepdad's studio, can you get the vocals off and come and sing to them? And I went, yeah. So I went back up north, stripped the vocals off, came back down, sang in the reception with a shitty mic somebody would found in the building that wasn't for doing vocals really, but whatever, you know, mm -hmm. no reverb through some bass cabinet, 15 inch nonsense speaker, just in the reception sang these four songs and Peter Robinson who's the head of A&R at RCA said who wrote these songs and like that Waterman goes oh Rick did he's a great songwriter as well mm. <laughs> maybe so those four songs ended up on the record so it good. might not have been those four actually but, but I ended up with four songs on it yeah and so all I'm trying to say is is that also not... it's worth mentioning yeah I think that you sold was it 40 million I think they make that up, to be honest. Nah. The first album I know for These a fact... These are based on stats. Facts okay, and okay. stats. I know the first album sold somewhere in the region of like eight or nine million copies. So having four songs on there was pretty amazing in terms I of... I read, my, and I quote... Oh, go on if, then. If yeah. you will. <laughs> wait, I've made it up. Go on. <laughs> no, wait. I think what, what it is is that what it's... Was it? I thought but it's the confusion of albums. 40 million and, albums. I think it's the confusion of albums and singles as well. Oh. We sold a lot of singles back then. I mean, literally, yeah. I've... I've, I think I got a thing recently. Um, 
and I can't remember how many millions it is and I know that sounds a bit what have you but it's a lot of yeah, millions I know what you did as well when they gave it to you you said put this with the others <laughs> put that in the vault <laughs> um, no it was really lovely actually we'd, we'd, we'd played at the Albert Hall and which is an amazing yeah. godsend thing to do anyway incredible experience and, and uh, obviously a lot of the label were there and everything and I'm really good friends with some of the people there as well and I've known them for a bit and they weren't there in the first because it's BMG and they weren't there when I was signed to BMG RCA back then mm. but it's sort of become this interesting thing because they still own the catalogue so it makes sense for them to be helping me try and have records out today and kind of rejig that a bit and get yeah. it going again yeah. um, so we had this thing uh, a year or so ago where I can't remember what it is but it's a lot of millions <laughs> That, that it, that I love it's, that. That it's that it's that, that never going to give you up as sold as actual they singles. Just do a disc. Just a lot. A of, lot of millions. Oh. <laughs> you yeah. deserve it. Not like in a not in a like an Elton sort of lot of. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But a lot of. But yeah, you can yeah, specify that, that in, in the there, small yeah, yeah. print. <laughs> um, so, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say this um, that I understand why people would think, well, he's just a twat. He doesn't know what you know, whatever, and. Um, he's not a musician he's not a this he's not a that I would totally understand that and yet if they would have looked at the album they'd gone oh actually he did write four of the yeah. songs I didn't write any singles on the first album mm. to be fair well, I got a few normal, on the second but and, they, and they'd go oh and he played keyboards and guitar on it oh okay they'd still yeah. think I was a twat but at least they'd have to say yeah well he's sort of a bit of a musician then Yeah. and I just sort of ignored it I, d I didn't ignore it that's not fair um, I was gonna, uh, I did it a must bit have affected sort of, you it did it did of course it did and it made me just think well okay well I'm kind of tired with that for the rest of my life then or, or well I say the rest of my life I was in my 20s I was thinking for as, as long as this will possibly last um, and that's what people did will, you have that thing where you wake up every morning and think is it over now <laughs> Um, and then you realise I think a I few a interactions <clears throat> into the day you realise that it's not over yet I think I had a few things where I realised it wasn't really I didn't want to do it anymore 100% I just had enough of it big really? time um, one of the main things that became apparent was I still don't like it now I don't like flying um, I used to fly every other day kind of thing mm -hmm. and I found myself taking trains in Europe and doing all sorts of things not to get on a plane really? and we uh, I've said this in an interview I'm not it's no no there's no shame in it there's no anything in it it's just a thing we were going to go to uh, New York and I was going to be on a, like a big TV show and sing the new song and all the rest of it mm. and we were on the way to the airport and I just turned to my manager and said I can't go I can't do this anymore and we went home and he contacted the label and said look he's not in a great space he doesn't want to do it anymore and listen I wasn't do you think I that's something that would like in this day and age if, if like an artist at that level said something like that do you think it would be something like one of those men's mental health crises type things do, do you think that, that would be something that you'd I think, bill I th it as now I th yeah and I think people I think the thing is <clears throat> I wasn't at, at the peak of my thing at all I'd had like an album that actually still did all right you know yeah. but in, compared to the others didn't i always think and about that like I, I, our second album didn't do what the first one did right but i'd give both of my testicles to have those sorts of numbers on right. the album yeah. today and that's, the, and that's the weird thing isn't it it's kind of like it's just relative to something yeah. else and like your thing as well when when your thing happened it just went boom and like you couldn't i don't think unless you were under a rock or something you knew you guys were and you knew those tunes you mm. just did you just did mm. and if you've ever done that mm. everything else nothing is else like i've always said first single downhill from here because it literally <laughs> was it's the yeah, biggest yeah. song i've ever had mm. and i'll never get anywhere I couldn't dream of getting close mm. to it again you know what i mean well, what a wonderful position to be in to have that oh listen I mean, did you, when, how long did it take before you started to really appreciate how great it is to have had a song that's I think, affected so many people i think um what what happened when i kind of had it wasn't just a moment but when I kind of packed it in because I think the label were like look this isn't really going the way we want it to go either and mm. chances of having proper hits with him again he's a pop singer he's had his moment so they were happy to let me go I think mm. and so I just walked away and you know went off and all the rest of it became a dad well I already was a dad at that point but mm. um, <clears throat> and it's only I think going through a few years of not not doing any of that nonsense that you start to relate to what it was if you're yeah. still doing it 
I don't think you can be far enough away from it to know what it is and what it was and what, what the, you know. So you needed some time away from it and a bit of perspective. Definitely. And, yeah. 100%. Were you um, sad when you stopped? You no, know? I was relieved as really? hell. Yeah. Immediately? Yeah. And did you have like um, a shrine in one of your downstairs bathrooms with all of the uh, <laughs> many millions? In of which house, darling? No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I just went with you on that. Um, <clears throat> um, no, no. We're the only, the what did only, you do with all your... The only disc we've ever had up in our house was, long story, name drop, kaching. Uh, I know Elton a little bit. And I'm also really, really good friends with um, Davy Johnston, who's been his guitar player forever, mm -hmm. who's a beautiful, lovely man, by the way, amazing. I don't think I've met him, but he's an incredible guy. Um, and Davy would always say, hey, you know, we're recording in the townhouse or wherever we are. Why don't you come say hi, you know, come and hang out a bit, mm -hmm. which for me was a fucking big deal. Yeah, right? of course. N not just because it was Elton, but because it was Elton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but also because this is a bunch of people who been doing this quite a while at a at a level that's almost like they're they're like that you open the book mm. and all right there's Lennon and McCartney and there's the Stones yeah. or whoever there is right yeah. but he's he's in there page yeah, one yeah. and he's like I'm gonna go and hang out at the studio well, what's your favorite Elton album oh my god um it's really weird I went through Elton's catalog mm -hmm. when I did this thing in what's it I'm a bit of a I still really love I've got to be honest I like Yellow Brick Road yeah, and when I went to the a couple can of I tell gigs, you the correct answer to that? Oh, go on. What's the correct? <laughs> go on, go on. Madman across the water. Okay, I know it's a lot of people's favourites. Yeah, mm. I think it. I think it also depends again because he's been there forever. For people who are a bit younger than him, let's say, or a lot younger than him, um, I'm trying to be polite. I don't know what the best <laughs> way to say that. Anyway, I'm younger than Elton. Yeah, um, just. Um, <laughs> I think what I'm trying to say is you. You. It's a bit like Beatles. Mm. records even though mm. they they were very condensed in the time they made mm. them in but he was doing it, two a year wasn't he for, yeah he's doing some mad stuff yeah mm. um but i kind of think when you come across an artist that record you come across which is obviously not necessarily the first or second mm. or even third sometimes with someone like him yeah it's like that's the one you go oh well this is interesting what what's going on here and therefore it's hard to so yellow brick road what's yes, the, what's the best beatles album best beatles album uh I'm not going to say Sergeant Pepper's, even though as a young child it definitely was. Yeah, that's the one that resonated with me as a young person. Because because I think a lot of it's quite, in a, in a beautiful way, is quite childlike mm -hmm. in its melodic content yeah. here and there, and some of the noises in it, mm -hmm. some of the sounds, and some of the sort of. But like, if you reflect on their catalogue as a adult, what's uh, your favourite? I listened to Let It Be a lot recently because mm -hmm. you know the the, the anniversary yeah. thing and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely later Beatles, yeah. and I know you know we all kind of love later Beatles because they were just amazing, and they just mm. got super experimental and like, what are they doing? It was like, what the hell are they doing? You know, um, so I'd probably say that. I think um, I'm a bit of a moron. I, I I very often I'm at home and I'm on Sonos and I just go just play everything. Yeah, and and I don't necessarily go back. I'm and go, Hang that on, that's on Revolver, actually. and I go, yeah. is it or is it not? I can't remember. Mm. I don't. I'm not that bothered. Uh, what so it's you'll on. go for the, in, all of the songs in, in a no way, yeah, order, yeah. In a way, I, a I do, there are certain albums that mm. I listen to, and I'll go as an album. That's incredible. I did it with a band called Love and Money the other day. It's a long story. I was cleaning the car. There you go. <laughs> yes, I clean my own car. I don't really clean my own car. This was a is very it a special. Jack with uh, lever no, upholstery. It's, not. it's an old Mercedes, actually. But anyway, nice. it's a present from my wife from years ago. It's a long story. Mm. Anyway, the rain had got in, so I had to get a sponge. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Let's get on with the, what we're doing here today. Um, so anyway, we were just going through things, and I can't remember why, but Lena said, my wife said something about, what was the name of that Scottish band that did it? And I said, well, it's Love, it's love and Money, you know. They did an album. Uh, Jeff Pacaro played drums on it. So I'm all over that already, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it was produced by um, the guy who did Night Fly and worked with Donald Fagan a lot. Uh, Gary Katz who I met later it doesn't matter anyway that record Love and Money and it's called Love, Love and, and Money, Money and it's called Love and Money the album some great guitar on there by the oh, way okay. some beautiful playing of every that's kind that's a really good recommendation honestly it's just it's of its time but it's a beautiful mm. record and every now and again I definitely do that I definitely mm. say I just want to play that record from start to finish and, and just remember it and hear it and feel it again as I did mm. but when it comes to someone like a Bowie or something there's a lot of that a lot of his records that I couldn't tell you what songs were on what mm. I'd really struggle with it mm. but I still love them 
And I just think because of the last 15, 20 years of the way I've been playing music and listening to it and streaming it, let's say, yeah. I've sort of got out of the habit of going... So you, you don't know, go... For, yeah, so a long player doesn't mean the same things it used to. I do, I do like it. And we do have a record player at home. Mm. And once you start doing that, you do get back into it because it just goes across the thing and plays it you know what i mean but i think mm -hmm. i think partly what it is like we're we're having a dinner at home let's say and i'm playing something or a friend is we did it with roxy music the other night mm. and he's going oh my god listen to because i avalon is one of my all-time favorite albums mm -hmm. so i was playing something i think i just started avalon i thought i'm gonna have that on during dinner and just listen to it kind of thing and then before we know what we're doing we're listening to roxy music from 10 years before mm -hmm. and a bit of this and a bit of that and going hang on a minute brian ferry solo albums how many solo albums did you do you know what i mean and that's yeah. what streaming does to me yeah right. you jump around a you, lot you rabbit hole don't you yeah and it's it is a bit <laughs> tricky but i do it's tricky in the sense of is it is it doing an album justice no because you don't no. get to track eight sometimes because it no. sparks a memory off. and also there used to be an art in the way they were mastered as well yeah like in just in, even in terms of the song spacings and the way the, yeah. the experience of listening to a long player yeah. is. And didn't they put tracks either towards the center or to the end that were less bass heavy? Yeah, because that's they knew how we've they always done it. We'd cut. Is that you? Okay. Yeah, like we, so in a rock album, like an Aerosmith record, usually when there's a ballad, they stick that at the end of the side. Right. Because the needle's closer to the middle and it isn't going to react have the same as much. way. Hmm. Yeah. Which is mad to think about, isn't it? Yeah. Really. Because I always just thought it was just the experience. It was like really involved love making and then a lovely cuddle at the end yeah okay you know, and i thought that was the idea interesting that's why we've it probably was yeah the well, idea, well you know. sure it was yeah yeah i don't yeah. know what we're on about we're no, not around, <laughs> yeah. it's good no but Very the enjoyable. thing is you you um you're obviously really passionate about music and i wondered if that was why your hiatus was abridged and why you, what brought um, you back well i think uh in a nutshell there's probably two things i had a little studio built in fulham when I say little, it was a really nice little setup. Had a two-inch machine and everything. It was just at the very end of like tape machines and all of so that. So tell me what year that would have been. Um, that's a good point. It would have been about ninety-three, I think. Okay. Were you living so around Parsons Green in the late nineties? That's where the studio was in Parsons Green, but I didn't live there. Do you know what? Go on. <laughs> you're the mo you're the first famous person I saw in real life. You're joking. Outside of you know. A performance did thing. you live in Parsons Green then no I I didn't but I um I was my did my first publishing deal with Rondor music yeah was I on know Rondor, yeah, yeah I know yeah. some of the guys who work there right so I went round the corner looking for something to eat or whatever and went in the little cafe uh, on uh, the you were you were just crossing the road oh and I was like fuck me that's Rick Astley and now wow. here we are here we are after all this time <laughs> yeah. Rondor I remember it well mm. we used to know a guy called Russ there quite well and, and we'd have coffees in a little coffee shop around the corner okay did you ever He's meet someone called um David Owen yeah, I think I did, yeah. Yeah, he was my yeah. main right. guy, yeah. Matt. Yeah. I mean, there's loads of little studios down that little alleyway there. Well, they had a good so one in the basement yes, there. Yes, I know, yeah, yeah, I've been in there, yeah. 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 No, I, I had that studio for quite a while, and it became a bit of a hangout, the studio, with friends and stuff and everything, and just, you know, I'd lend it to friends as well and all the rest of it. Mm. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but I kind of... I didn't know exactly why I was doing it. I just wanted, to, it was a bit like I had some money and I didn't want a Ferrari. And I thought, well, I'll buy a nice, get a new studio going, you know, and I did that. And um, I, I wanted to write for other people possibly and produce for other people. Didn't, I, I could possibly do it now, I don't know, but I certainly didn't have the chops then. I was fumbling about really in the dark, but mm. I still loved going there every day and mm. just making music and have my drums set up, mic'd up all the time and awesome. everything, which is a proper amazing thing to have. Yeah. Um, and I just loved it. Um, but I kind of, the truth of it is, I used to get offers to go and do my old songs, go and, go and do gigs and what have you, sometimes with other artists from my era, like a nostalgia sort of thing. And I always said, no thanks, appreciate it, but no thanks. Not in a sort of, oh dear, you know, not, mm. nothing like that. Just kind of like, no, I don't, think I, I don't think I can, I don't think I can bring myself to go up there and do that, if you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah. And then we had this offer, um, come to Japan and sing your old tunes. Oh my uh, God, and it's almost like the Spinal Tap narrative. It is, it? it is, honest to God. And I'm not saying I had to learn them again, because they're just in there, yeah. they're in my DNA now. But I did sort of have to go through the lyrics properly and go, what the, what's the track for on the second album? What, what is that? So, and, um, and there were a couple of other artists on, on, the, on the bill, as we'll call it. And, um, and I went, I think even when I went to the rehearsals, because it was like a house band that was put together to do this thing, mm. a certain promoter had done all that, uh, of English guys who went over there and everything. 
and I went to rehearse and thought, well, that was really good fun, actually, just being in a room with a load of musicians just banging those tunes out. That was actually yeah. quite good fun. But then there's not the, there's a, still a disconnect of actually doing it in front of anybody. Yeah, yeah. So, but the, the, the main thing was our daughter was about 14. She really wanted to study art at that point, and she did. She got a master's in art now, years ago. Um, and she loved the idea of anything from Japan, you know, anything about J Japanese art and, and you know, yeah, the yeah. design and everything. And my wife, Lena, had never been to Japan at this point. And they literally just got me in the kitchen up against the cabinets, you know, sort of going. <laughs> and so we went to Japan wow. and I did three gigs. And literally the first one, I just said to the audience, I said, look, this is the biggest karaoke in Tokyo tonight. Let's get involved. And, and we did the gig Brilliant. and I kind of loved it. But it wasn't like, this is the start of something, this is a what have you. I just thought, I really enjoyed that. And I think the fact I wasn't promoting a record, mm. wasn't really doing interviews. Yeah. I might have done one interview for it or a couple of, you know, but I wasn't, I wasn't on the treadmill. Yeah. And it was like, well, we'll be going home soon. Oh, I just want to throw into this because it, it is actually, to me, it's important. Um, my wife has worked in movies a lot and produced movies and all sorts of it. She got nominated with the director, obviously, for a short film. So wow. we went to the fricking Oscars. For, I went for 24 hours to LA because I was doing something. Went to the Oscars, went down the red carpet in a brand new tux and all the rest of it, in yeah. all my wife's hand and all the rest of it. Our daughter went. They stayed for a day or two. I flew then to, to Japan, to Tokyo, I think, to go on stage for the first time. So that 48, <laughs> 50, 60 hours. What a weekend. was mental. Wow. Like as mad as it, as mad as it could be. Mm. And I think the whole thing led me to thinking, well, you could do a bit of this. Yeah. You could just get up and... Do a bit of Oscars in Japan stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not the Oscars thing. But, but, but that, in a way, what I'm trying to say is it almost like turned it so on its head, yeah. so mad. You know, we stayed up all night mm -hmm. that night and we just went to, as, as you it do. It must have you been get, really... Because after a hiatus when you come back and you've had that sort of self-doubt and yeah. that period of time yeah, when you yeah. think everybody thinks you're a twat, yeah. that can only get compounded by not being exposed to your own audience. Yeah. And then to have the courage to get out there and do it and then just be rewarded by presumably unanimously enthusiastic response. Yeah, right? it was very enthusiastic. And that's that's more-ish as well, isn't it? Of course it is. And I think it, but also I think for me, it was the thing of like, um, I think I felt when I had my few years at it back in the end of the 80s and scraping into the 90s I think I felt it's all or nothing it's mm. literally all or nothing you can't say no to anything mm. someone just sends you this promo schedule and you go uh, that's the northern uh, man's uh, work ethic you need to say well, yes to everything maybe but I think <laughs> it was a lot of people's I don't know about you guys but it was a lot of people's like well how do we say how do we say no to that mm. Italian radio show that yeah. wants us to it's what we're supposed to do isn't it well, that's so what you, nearly killed me just didn't I'll, say no to anything yeah well it? I'll bet I'll mm. bet but also because again when something explodes in the way that your thing did as well it, literally the world's your lobster mm. and it's like you're getting asked to do all kinds of shit mm. and it's like how do you say what do you say no and also you, you haven't done it before so you think well we're not doing that again that was ridiculous yeah. if they want us to come and play we'll do that but if they just want to sit us on a rock on a beach talking about this that and the other and going did you ever do you know what I mean do you never feel like what am I doing here this is not who I am actually most of the time <clears> when I had that most acutely we were, on, we were on some sort of Japanese uh, game show. I had right. no fucking idea what was happening. Right, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I yeah. Mean, not just the language, but just like, yeah. I just couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. And so like, it's just me sort of looking around going, what, 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 why am I here? What is this? Yeah. What even is this? You know? And, yeah. Well, and I, there's a few I, sort of surreal I, I, moments like yeah. that. Yeah, you know? and I, I listen, believe me, that echoes really strongly with a few things I, I did where I'm kind of like, one in particular, because I, I love saying this or, or whatever. The, to go to do a TV show in Germany, right? And I'm in the middle of my thing, so I'm used to going doing TVs, and they're all a bit odd. But ours are a bit odd. We just know them. Yeah. Like Ant and Deck doing yeah, right. whatever. Okay, it's that's like, true. What yeah. are they doing now? It's mad, you know. Yeah. But we know them, so it's fine and lovely and whatever, right? Yeah. But when you go to Germany or Japan or something, mm. and you don't speak the language, and you don't really get it. Yeah. So there was one show that had, I think, like um, like a mouse, and he was in like this um, camera was above him, mm -hmm. and whichever door he went out for his bit of cheese, that person won something. This is a massive Saturday night TV <laughs> show, right? And I'm looking at this and I'm going, and then all of a sudden someone brings a camel on, mm. right? a live camel, mm. which if we think about Saturday night British TV, that mm. could easily happen, someone mm. bring a camel on. But when you're in Germany, it's like, 
what am I doing here? Mm. I've just sung a song and I'm going to sing the new single in a minute. Mm. What am I, why am I doing this? I'm kind of looking at people. I'm not getting stroppy, but I'm like, are you sure we should be doing this? Is this the show we should be on kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. I wasn't even being that stroppy really. But, and then they said, ladies and gentlemen, Rod Stewart. And Rod Stewart came on and I went, that'll do for me. <laughs> if Rod's here, then I'm here. Yeah, that's it. I'm that's here. all you need. I'd have been okay with the camel so. <laughs> <laughs> at this point. Yeah, maybe. Well, listen, we better wrap it up. You've been absolutely okay. brilliant. Um, Thank you. Listen, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah. I'm still stunned about the DX7. <laughs> honestly, I can't wait to... I'll show you my other tattoos in a minute. Yeah, well, <laughs> but honestly, I can't wait to tell people that because I know they're going to see it anyway, but I, I've got certain keyboard not friends who are literally just going to be able to... They're not going to be able to digest that. That's going to take a while. <laughs> That's good. Well, I'm glad I've managed to startle you in some yeah, way. Indeed, thank my love. So thank much. you. No, Absolutely also, thank awesome. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Rick Astley. Thank you. <laughs> that was fucking amazing. Great. Wow. Okay.